all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Uh, I want to say good morning to you this morning. Welcome to worship, and we welcome you both here and, and online. Hope you enjoy our service. Gracious and holy God, we stand before you this morning and we celebrate Easter. We are Easter people. We celebrate the risen Christ. We celebrate the fact that you loved us enough to send your own one and only son to die for us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to have the right attitude, the right mind, the right heart. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. And help us to worship and praise you with everything in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. morning our opening hymn is 304 Easter people raise your voices 304 please stand standing for our affirmation of faith found on page 880 the Nicene Creed we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and Who with the Father and the Son 
baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. may be seated. We come now to a time in our worship where we share our joys and our concerns. Gracious and holy God, you've heard our request. You, you know our needs. And Lord, we lift our hearts up to you because you are a God who is worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our glory. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be the people that you call us to be. Lord, we know you are a God of mercy. And we thank you for the risen Christ. Lord, we pray that you would make every day new for us again because you have made us a new creation. We pray for all of those who are in the hospital, all those who are who are suffering unknown answers to questions about their health. We pray for all of those who are, are facing surgery and don't know the results. Lord, we pray that you'll give them courage and be with the doctors and nurses as they, as they, um, give, as they go through surgery. Lord, we pray for wisdom for the doctors and nurses. We pray for compassion. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house of worship today. Lord, we come to your house with joy and thanksgiving. And Lord, we praise you for all that you are and all that we do. And we praise you especially for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together as, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Will our ushers come forward for God's tithes and our offerings?
Will you stand? Gracious God, who is the source of our life, may the works of our hands bring you honor. May the life we live reflect the risen word of life. May the, may the service we offer be inspired by your breath. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated.
A reading this morning from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let thy Holy One see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou wilt make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon the throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joel. Gracious and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. I find it interesting that Acts is not, not as much a narrative as it is a group of speeches from Peter and Paul. For sermons, basically, there is some narrative in Acts, but there's a lot of sermons in there. And the church, uh, when, when Luke wrote Acts, was confronted by a crowd who some understood about Jesus and some did not. The church, as we remember, was still like Peter and Paul. It was a Jewish church. And Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and this is part of his sermon. Peter addresses fellow Israelites and he is preaching about the resurrection and what it means for them and what it means for us today. Peter is, is interpreting the gospel through sermons. And, and Luke is doing this in, in Acts, and so is Paul. Luke, the author, was a classic historian who uses historical figures to interpret events. A couple examples of this would be, in our time, would be Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln did more than open a cemetery. He gave meaning and substance to an overwhelming, violently destructive civil war. A good speech can turn us inside out, says Will Willimon. And it can, can't it? A good speech can turn us inside out. And that's what Luke is doing in Acts. And Paul, he's used, Paul is the, the one who's preaching, and, and Luke is telling about, I mean, Peter's preaching. This is what Luke is doing. And he's turn, trying to turn us inside out, and he does that. The apostolic mission after the resurrection was to preach the gospel to all nations. And you know, that day when Peter, Peter was preaching, I'm tongue-tied this morning, when Peter was preaching, 3,000 people were converted. 3,000 people. Now that wasn't Peter's skills. That was the effect of the Holy Spirit that was poured out that day. The Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, wasn't it? 
in Jesus Christ, there's power loose in the world that is available to all of us who believe. The resurrection, according to Peter and Paul, is God's promise and God's fulfillment. It is a part, there's no separation between Israel, the Old Testament, and the new polis of Peter saying. There's no separation there. He's saying that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. He uses Joel at the beginning of that sermon. He's saying that Jesus Christ It was told ahead of time, God promised to Abraham, God promised to David that there would be an everlasting covenant. And God, and Paul, Peter, um, Peter is saying that David and Jesus, he's comparing the two. And the fact that Jesus is better than David, if you could say better, Jesus is on a higher scale than David because Jesus was raised from the dead. When I went to Israel, David was still in the tomb. And that's what he's saying. David was still dead and Jesus was raised from the dead. So there's that fulfillment there. There's that When Jesus was born, it confirms the Messianic hopes. When Jesus suffered and died, it was part of the prophecy of the Hebrew Scriptures. And then the baffling events of the Pentecost was part of God's resurrection plan when Jesus was brought back to life. That was part of the plan. Now Luke says both humanity... That is the Jews, the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, not just the Jews in general. We have to be careful of that, not to be uh, anti-Semitic. But the Jews and the Romans crucified Jesus. And the you there is plural. They crucified, and he says, you crucified. But God, but God raised him from the dead. But God brought forth the resurrection. And but God fulfilled the promise, the everlasting covenant that he made with David. And many devout Jews that Peter is speaking to in his sermon were cut to the heart. They listened closely. And he says, listen, how many times in this scripture does he say, listen, He starts out, he says, All who live in Jerusalem, let let this be known to you. Listen to what I say. Fellow Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Listen. Listen closely, he's saying. Listen closely. I'm telling you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were cut to the heart, which literally means stabbed in the heart. And when you're stabbed, you're wounded, aren't you? It's painful. And sometimes it's painful to see what we do. You know, I've had teenagers before, and sometimes I look up to the sky, and when they, and you look up and you think, Lord, have mercy. How do you stand us? How do you tolerate us? How do you do it? Because teenagers are hard sometimes, aren't they? Mine are all grown now, but sometimes they still (laughs) cut me to the heart. (laughs) And that's just normal, being a parent. But then they ask, what should we do? What should we do? And Peter says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Wow. Think about that. Think about how how perfect that is and what a gift that is in our lives to be baptized into Christ. To, to have our sins forgiven 
and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Shirley Guthrie, a theology professor from Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta, says, what does it mean to be a Christian? In other words, she's saying, what does it mean? What does, shall we do? Like Peter is asking the group that he's talking about. What shall we do? And Guthrie doesn't give one answer. She gives four. She gives orthodoxy, moralism, social activism, and piety. What shall we do? To those who are Orthodox fans, the answer is make sure your preaching and learning at the church is pure. To believe the right thing. Moralism, what do they see? And maybe we, that people in the church behave. Christianity is mainly a matter of discovering the ethical precepts of the faith and following them, doing the right thing. Then the social activist answers, the purpose of the church is to change the world, to root out and destroy injustice, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to make this planet a better place for everyone to live. And then there's the pious. The pious say that nothing else in life matters as long as one has a personal relationship with Christ. Becoming Christian is a matter of getting to know Christ, no more and no less, and to live our life bringing in others. Now, there's truth in all of these, isn't there? Which one is it? Yes, it's all of them, isn't it? All of these is what it means to follow Jesus. Because Jesus is all of these things, and he did all of these things in his earthly ministry. His deepest desire for us was to do the right thing, to believe the right thing, to advocate the right thing, and to pray the right thing. Now, prayer is not about getting what we want, is it? Prayer, according to Brian Blunt, a New Testament professor, says prayer is about unleashing the frightening, unstable, uncontrollable power of God. Have you ever thought about prayer that way? Releasing and unleashing the frightening, unstable, uncontrollable power of God. That's what it means to pray. Peter is... is trying to get the the church, which is the Jewish community at the time, and some Gentiles, he's trying to get them to listen. And he's telling them, God, but God raised this Jesus Christ from the dead. He's alive. He's not gone. And And Peter says that Jesus did, that God did power, deeds of power, wonders, and signs through Jesus. And he says, you are witnesses. Because they were. They saw Jesus Christ resurrected. They knew that he had been raised from the dead. They knew the tomb had been emptied. Even though some of them tried to make a plot saying that it it hadn't. And perhaps to be a witness, our life becomes the gospel. I'm going to tell you a story. One day, a monk found a precious gemstone. He put it in his knapsack and carried it with him. He met a traveler on the road of life in need of of, of food and provisions. The monk opened his knapsack to share his food, and his fingers found the gem. So he lifted it out and gave it to the traveler. Overjoyed with good fortune, the traveler took the valuable stone and went on his way. A few days later, however, the traveler caught up with the monk and he begged him again, please give me something more precious than this stone. 
Please give me what prompted you to give this stone to me. Just like the traveler who encountered the monk, we ask God to give us a life that, be, that, be can, that can become the gospel to our fellow travelers and help us live in such a way as this. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn is 312, Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of 312. Please stand. this benediction the disciples were fed with the food of life the words of Jesus Christ the words of God the word nourishes it empowers us to go into the world with renewed strength and power go with faith and go with hope of the resurrection amen